to review um, some aspects of uh, CPIC levels and um, FDA information on pharmacogenomics. And just as a quick review, many factors cause inter-individual variability in drug effects and genetics is just one such uh, factor. And of course, these include things like liver function, renal function, diet, drug interactions, concurrent diseases. And so it's just a reminder that um, pharmacogenomics is just one of many aspects that affects inter-individual variability. CPIC handles pharmacogenomics. CPIC provides guidance for clinicians what to do when there is pharmacogenomic information available and which gene drug pairs require uh, clinical actionability. Also to point out that, of course, there are many resources that are used to guide prescribing based on these inter-individual factors, and I've listed a few of them here, Micromedics, Facts and Comparisons, USP, AHFS, um, and of course, approved drug labels are another source of information that can be used to help drug guide prescribing. And CPIC guidelines, we think, are of course an extremely useful resource to use for pharmacogenomic guidelines to guide prescribing. But unfortunately, there's not one place where one can go where, where one can get all the information that one needs to help guide prescribing based on these inter-individual factors. And in fact, sometimes, of course, we even have to do primary literature searches for rare uh, drug considerations in order to help provide the best prescribing advice that we can. So there is no one-stop shopping for prescribing information. Now CPIC has multiple levels and grading systems and they are not all equivalent to evidence level and I'm going to review these systems in this presentation. One is that we grade gene drug pairs for their prescribing actionability as to level A, B, C, or D. Another is that we grade the strength of prescribing recommendations as strong, moderate, optional, or no recommendations. A third is that the relevant findings from the literature that are related to prescribing recommendations are graded as to the strength of evidence for high, moderate, and weak. And a fourth is that when we assign clinical function to alleles, we also grade the strength of the evidence backing up that assignment as high, moderate, and weak. Our goal is to write guidelines for all CPIC actionability level A and B gene drug pairs. So for all gene drug pairs that are encompassed by the guideline, we provide prescribing recommendations for all phenotype drug possibilities. The experts, of course, consider other existing guidelines and consider regulatory agency comments from the FDA, the EMA, and others in deciding on prescribing recommendations and in evaluating the evidence. As I mentioned, there's a strength for each prescribing recommendation. And uh, the grading of the evidence which includes not only the findings for the gene drug pair, but very alternatively, very importantly, the evidence for the alternative therapy that may be recommended in high risk gene drug pair combinations. All of that evidence informs the expert author's prescribing recommendations. And the prescribing recommendations are really the heart of the CPIC guideline, and they are usually summarized in table two of each guideline. This is an example for a single gene and a single CYP2B6 and a single drug efavirenz. And you can see that for each of the five phenotypic categories of metabolizer types, there's a, a strength of the recommendation for prescribing. In this case, all are either strong or moderate. Here's another example for the PPIs in CYP2C19, and you can see that there are strengths of recommendations that differ for the drugs. Listed uh, some of the PPIs in this column, another PPI in the last column, and you can see that not all uh, prescribing recommendations for this gene 
gene drug class pair are identical. Some are moderate and some are optional and that's based on all of the evidence reviewed by the authors in putting together their prescribing recommendations. And there are some gene drug pairs, for example, we're looking at uh, on Dancitron and CYP2D6 table 2, where you can see that for some phenotypes there is a recommendation, but for some phenotypes there's no recommendation. And this comprehensive matching of phenotypes with drugs for each gene drug pair tackled by a CPIC guideline is uh, unique to CPIC guidelines compared to other resources that might be used for prescribing recommendations. So a little bit more about these prescribing actionability levels for CPIC. And this gene drug pair is one of the most visited pages on the CPIC site. And we do have uh, an actionability level assigned to all of the gene drug pairs uh, listed here. Um, and you can see that these are sorted. And so these are all CPIC level A gene drug pairs listed uh, here. Um, and notice it is the CPIC level, it's not the CPIC level of evidence that's summarized here, it's the CPIC actionability level. And that is not identical to the PharmGKB level of evidence or to the pharmacogenomic information that is included in the FDA label, which has been summarized by the PharmGKB staff in this table of gene drug pairs. So a little bit more background of uh, that information. So PharmGKB staff put a lot of work into annotating these gene drug pairs with information that is included in the FDA approved drug label, or uh, in some cases is ga gathered from other places um, um, such as the table of pharmacogenomic biomarkers in drug labels that is put together by the FDA. And they go to the trouble of trying to find where the pharmacogenomic information is in each drug label and classify it as to whether it seems that the FDA is saying testing is required, testing is recommended, there's some sort of actionable pharmacogenomics or some kind of uh, informative pharmacogenomics. So uh, this column that's summarized on the um, uh, CPIC gene drug pair is in fact a, a PharmGKB summary of its understanding of the FDA label at that time point. It's also worthwhile pointing out that there are two main tables of pharmacogenomics on the FDA uh, sites. There's one called the Table of Pharmacogenomic Biomarkers in Drug Labeling that's put together by CEDAR, the drugs part of FDA. And there's a second Table of Pharmacogenetic Associations that's put together by CDRH or the devices part of FDA. And this is the table that's been the topic of some conversations of uh, CPIC and other meetings over the last year or so. So the first table put together was this table of pharmacogenomic biomarkers in drug labeling. It's got 431 entries. It includes somatic and cancer genes, not just germline genes. And again, it's put together by CEDAR. And it says that the table lists therapeutic products with pharmacogenomic information found in the drug labeling. The labeling before some, but not all of the products include specific actions to be taken on the biomarker information, and they point out that pharmacogenomic information can appear in different sections of the label. This is just a screenshot of the top of those 431 entries um, sorted alphabetically, and you can see here is the drug name, the therapeutic area, the biomarker, which again is sometimes germline and sometimes somatic genes, and the section of the label that includes some mention of pharmacogenomics. This table is in contrast to the table that we've talked about a bit more over the last year or so that was uh, released a little bit over a year ago called the Table of Pharmacogenetic Associations. And it's actually three tables. Um, one table is the pharmacogenetic associations for which data support therapeutic recommendations. Uh, the second table is, is uh, those associations for which the data indicate a potential impact on safety or response. And the third table is for uh, drugs for which the data demonstrate a potential impact on PK properties only. 
and it says that the impact of these genetic variants on the safety or response of the corresponding drug have not been established. And there's a lot of um, caveats to this table, which include um, suggestion that the tests uh, are um, is not that this table is not intended to affect current regulatory requirements or policies, including FDA's policy regarding companion diagnostics, nor is the table intended to make an assessment on the safe and effective use of or regulatory requirements for tests that detect variants in these reference genes or to provide comprehensive information on the described gene drug interactions. Um, it also points out that it's a subset of genes, it's limited to those involved in drug metabolizing enzymes, drug transporters, or gene variants that have been related to a predisposition to certain adverse effects. So it's not comprehensive, and the FDA recognizes that it's not comprehensive and welcomes input uh, into this table as it is a work in progress. All right, so let's move back to CPIC and its actionability levels. And as uh, we mentioned, every gene drug pair is evaluated. If it's already the subject of a CPIC guideline, um, then we evaluate um, the evidence and alternatives for this uh, new drug and see whether it also uh, goes into a C an actionability level of A or B where prescribing action is recommended, um, or if it goes into a CPIC level C where there's a lot of uh, evidence, but it's uh, not clear, or it's weak, or it's conflicting, and very importantly, if the alternative therapy doesn't have enough evidence, then a gene drug pair may go into level C because it's impossible to make an evidence-based prescribing recommendation for what to do for the high-risk phenotype. And CPIC level D, of course, are uh, have even less evidence um, and testing is relatively uh, rare. And we're constantly reevaluating the uh, actionability levels to the CPIC gene drug pairs. And we often get feedback from you, uh, our CPIC members, and from other groups uh, about reconsidering where we have classified a, a CPIC uh, gene drug pair. And that's important because really until our authors have time to go through and take on a guideline and really evaluate all of the evidence for a gene drug pair, there, our assignment of actionability is considered provisional because it's not really until a guideline is created that we think that we can assign the actionability to a gene drug pair uh, more definitively. So if you look at the gene drug pair uh, page, you'll see that many of the assignments are provisional and again are influenced um, by feedback from the community. We have uh, reevaluated our actionability levels extensively and comprehensively over the last year or two and uh, defined more clearly what we mean by not only CPIC levels A, B, C, or D, but also what it means when we say that we assign a gene drug pair as A, B. We need to have a full evidence review to assign, but we feel it's very likely that some prescribing actionability is there. And many gene drug pairs fall in this BC category where there's obviously a lot of evidence, but it's really not clear without a complete evidence review whether the gene drug pair will go into the actionability level uh, A or B versus C where there's no actionability. And the evidence levels, as I mentioned, especially for pairs C and D can really vary dramatically. There may be a lot of evidence but if it's conflicting or the actionability is not clear for the alternative therapy, it's going to stay at a CPIC level C. Right now, uh, there are 114 drugs that fall into the CPIC level A or B category, and I've summarized them here. You can see the asterisk indicates those uh, drugs that are on the top 100 prescribing list for at least for the United States. So some of these um, drugs are relatively commonly prescribed. All right, now the second uh, level that I'd like to talk about is the level of strength assigned to the prescribing recommendations. And we uh, the classification system that we use uh, is 
based on the classification that was originally put forward from NIAID for HIV drug therapy recommendations where they graded their recommendations as strong, moderate, or optional. Um, strong recommendation would be where the evidence is high quality and the desirable effects clearly outweigh the undesirable effects for the prescribing recommendation. Moderate means there's close or uncertain balance as to whether the evidence is high quality and the desirable clearly outweigh the undesirable effects of that moderate recommendation. Optional means the desirable effects are closely balanced with undesirable effects. There's room for differences in opinion on the need for the recommended course of action. And as we went through the CPIC process, we eventually uh, decided that there were going to be some phenotype drug combinations included in a CPIC guideline for which there was no recommendation. And that meant that there was insufficient evidence, confidence, or agreement to provide a recommendation to guide clinical practice at this time. That example I gave you with ondansetron and two of the CYP2D6 uh, phenotypes is such an example. We really try to avoid no recommendation because that's not very useful for clinicians. Uh, but we recognize that there are, because we're being comprehensive in our phenotype versus drug prescribing, there are some examples where we're going to have a combination that's a, a no recommendation. Um, the third way that we have levels of evidence relates to uh, the grading of the findings that relate to prescribing recommendations. And again, um, we base this um, based on some standard uh, terms that were used by a clinical laboratory organization. And those uh, three levels of evidence are high. The evidence includes consistent results from well-designed, well-conducted studies. Moderate, the evidence is sufficient to determine effects, but the strength of the evidence is limited by the number, quality, or consistency of studies generalizability to routine practice or indirect nature of the evidence. And weak evidence is insufficient to assess the effects on health outcomes because of a limited number or power of studies, important flaws in design or, con or conduct, and gaps in the chain of evidence. So as an example, this is a guideline that's currently being worked on for G6PD and the authors are grading the strength of the evidence that relates the drug to hemolysis specific to G6PD deficiency. So you can see uh, findings, there may be um, tens or hundreds of findings that are graded by our experts that go into the prescribing recommendations for each guideline. And as an example here is hemolysis with nitrofurantoin attributed to G6PD deficiency. Uh, in this column are the PubMed IDs that have been evaluated related to this finding. And uh, at least two independent reviewers grade the evidence. In one case, they gave it a high. In another, they gave it a moderate level of evidence. And then there's consensus by the entire group of authors uh, that overall the evidence should be graded as moderate in support of this finding. We also, of course, have uh, examples where there's conflicting evidence. So uh, above here with uh, furazolidine and G6PD deficiency, there's one publication in favor and one publication that refutes that association. And in this case, uh, all of our authors and the consensus was that this was weak evidence. So this process of grading the evidence related to all of these findings is really um, a very labor intensive process that our CPIC staff as well as our volunteer authors put a tremendous amount of work into coming consensus on the strength of evidence for each of these individual findings. And taken together, um, these findings go into the author's decision on how to make up their table two prescribing recommendations. Also, our authors uh, grade the evidence for assigning function to our alleles. And this has been um, a process that is detailed uh, in the CPIC allele function SOP, which of course is available to our members. It's undergone quite a bit of uh, work in the last year or so, and it's been piloted on several guidelines over the last year or two to have a more rigorous process for evaluating the evidence for allele function assignment. 
So uh, the overall process overview is that our at least two authors independently summarize the evidence, assign it a strength of evidence. Um, if necessary or if applicable, they will assign an activity uh, value to each allele and then write a summary of the findings that um, back up the strength of evidence for the functional assignment that they have made for uh, each allele and this table is disseminated to all of the authors for review and approval before the submission of the guideline. Uh, the strength of evidence to assign clinical function is a process that's been modified by that used by ClinGen for their gene disease validity evaluation and it's classified as to the type of evidence that if, uh, um, supports the allele function assignment. So of course there can be absolutely no evidence and then we assign a known function. There can be what we consider inadequate evidence and in that case the allele should be signed an uncertain function. Um, this designation is used when the evidence is not sufficiently strong to support a clinical functional status that can inform prescribing. And the threshold for what evidence is sufficient to inform actionability may differ among genes. So in this example, there may be fewer than two patient cases with no convincing in vitro experimental data or extremely limited or conflicting in vitro data. And um, if even with this very limited evidence, the authors feel that that allele is so likely to have actionable function, then they should not give it inadequate evidence on certain function, but they should assign function um, to that allele with limited evidence. So again, that could be based on a case report, in vitro data, computational predictions, and no convincing evidence has emerged that contradicts the role of the allele in the noted drug phenotype. And if the authors deem that the allele function is such that it would be actionable if it made up a diplotype of, uh, with another known functional allele, um, then there should be a function assigned to that allele even though the evidence is limited. And this is often a difficult uh, decision for our authors. It may take into account the frequency of the allele. It may also take into account the severity of grading the allele wrong. So if the uh, gene is involved in the pharmacodynamics or response for a life-threatening drug that could kill a patient from toxicity if it were given as a bolus dose uh, at the wrong dose in an affected individual, then they may be willing to assign function and act on more limited evidence than in a case where the drug is uh, has a better therapeutic range uh, and more titratable so that the decision for informing prescribing from the beginning is not as critical. So our authors have some leeway in how they interpret the evidence for different uh, genes and their likely drug pairs. Of course, moderate evidence has more evidence. Um, uh, strong evidence has even more. The causal role of the allele in the drug phenotype has been independently demonstrated in at least two clinical studies and there's no convincing evidence that's emerged. And then we have definitive allele functional assignments for canonical allele, for complete gene deletions, for uh, allele functions that have been used for at least three years uh, without any conflicting evidence, then the authors can define a definitive. Uh, again, they can make some modifications to this general framework. Um, on the threshold, as I gave you an example, bolus chemotherapy versus a chronic oral drug. Um, the gene-specific modifications to this overall evidence framework have to be summarized in that table that assigns the allele function um, and uh, so that it's uh, transparent how the allele function was made even in the setting of limited or perhaps conflicting evidence. So. The evidence based on allele clinical function characterization, all of the findings related to the gene drug association, the findings that are relevant to the alternative therapy that may be recommended, all of these are weighed by the experts in creating the prescribing recommendations that go into table two and are all actionable gene drug pairs are assigned actionability levels of 0.5. 
A or B, where there is at least some um, prescribing recommendation made for the gene drug pair for at least some phenotypes. So again, these overall actionability levels are included in the table of gene drug pairs, the A, B, C, or D, and that decision on actionability is based on all of those different forms of evidence that we've just reviewed. Um, finally, I wanted to just uh, point out and remind everyone that there are so many different resources used to guide prescribing. We're sometimes asked, what is CPIC doing to harmonize its recommendations with other groups that make prescribing recommendations based on pharmacogenomics? And uh, I, we just have to remind people that unfortunately there's not a harmonization among all drug prescribing resources for drug interactions, for how to dose drugs based on renal function, based on liver function, based on age, based on concurrent diseases. And it's very unlikely that there will be harmonization of all of these different uh, resources for prescribing based on pharmacogenomics either. We want to be as transparent, as clear as we can be as to how CPIC guidelines are put together and we hope that they're useful to the community. I'd like to just acknowledge uh, all of the team at CPIC, our co-principal investigators, um, all of our staff, uh, our steering committee, and our scientific advisory board. Um, many of you serve in CPIC informatics on the pharmacogenomics dissemination working group, and uh, especially to our authors, because we realize that this is a tremendous amount of work from them, and we really appreciate everyone working so hard to apply these CPIC standards to all of our CPIC guidelines. Um, thank you for your attention and don't hesitate to reach out to uh, me or Kelly or Terry or Michelle uh, if you've got uh, any comments or questions. Thank you very much.